Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the journey that Google has been on to understand how the mind works and see if we can uh, help people make better decisions, especially with regard to diversity. Um, and uh, I've been, it now, been in it now for almost three years, and I thought we would be sort of like at the end point, but I'm realizing it's like reading the Game of Thrones series where you get to like book three, and the cast of characters is huger than ever. The storyline is going in all directions, and you realize that this series will be going on for the rest of our lives. That is unconscious bias at Google. So what I want to do today is sort of tell you about our journey that we're on and impart some lessons to you, no matter how big or small your organization is right now. I think there are things that you can do to ensure that you're tapping into the right talent, that you're not being blinded by preconceptions and you're making better decisions. I, I'm going to start in an odd place, which is sort of a defense of unconscious bias. This is a picture of the city that I live in, uh, New York City, and it's a wonderful illustration of just how complicated and information rich our worlds are. Like the, our information is coming from every single sense every second of the day, uh, every second of our lives. And in fact, 11 million bits of information is hitting our senses, senses at every single second. And yet our conscious mind is able to process only 40 bits of information. That's remarkable, right? Your mind is this amazing machine. And it means that a majority of the decisions that we are making every single moment of our lives is governed completely by our unconscious mind. If our unconscious was not working on our behalf, we would have to be figuring out how to cross the street without hitting another pedestrian, how to be picking out our food at lunch. Most of these things are done completely without our conscious awareness. And this allows us to take that precious resource, which is cognitive attention and deliberation, and apply it only to those problems that are vexing, that are new, that require novel solutions. That's pretty amazing, right? Now, there's an evolutionary reason our minds work like this. Imagine that we are hundreds of thousands of years in our past, we're all living in caves, and I'm giving you all a presentation on unconscious bias, and I say, cave person, I want you to be completely unbiased today because it'll make you a better person. So as you go out into the savanna and you're gonna collect food, I want you to consciously process all that you're seeing and don't jump to any conclusions, don't make preconceptions, try to be an enlightened cave person. And so you go out, you're collecting food, you see a beast in the, in the, uh, in the plains, you don't want to jump to conclusions, but you're going to process the information. Well, it's got four legs. I'm going to conclude mammal. It's got a you know, tan fur. It's got pointy teeth. I'm going to conclude predator. Given all this information, I think I should probably run because I might be in danger and up a tree, you try to go. But at that point, you are not contributing to our evolution. You are most likely meat for the lion, right? This is what our unconscious, mi our unconscious mind is preventing us from actually doing. So there is a reason that we are processing information at such velocity. Today, we may no longer have to really identify lions, uh, but there are a lot of other decisions that we're making. Um, I was actually contemplating the merits of unconscious bias as we were going through this process earlier on, and I was actually wondering if we were making much ado about nothing. There's been a lot of press on stereotyping, bias, discrimination, and uh, there's also been a lot of backlash to it, saying like this isn't we're making too big a deal about it. So an idea struck me almost literally when I was crossing the street in the form of a New York City bus. And I saw this ad on the side of that bus, and it was an advertisement for the HBO series Silicon Valley. This is how our industry is thought of by the world. Right? We not only have stereotypes and prototypes of lions and tigers, we also have beliefs about people. Who's a computer scientist? Who's a leader? Where is the next great idea coming from? And all of us play a part in making this a reality. And so this may seem overly homogeneous to you, but if you look at the actual numbers of people who are starting their own companies and people who are in the high tech industry, it's not so different from what we see on the side of this bus. All of us play a part in that, and all of us can actually help change this picture. Maybe not this advertisement for Silicon Valley, but 15 years from now when they run that show, it could look a lot different. And so this is what we're trying to solve for. If we engage in this conversation about unconscious bias, if we make better decisions, what do we stand to gain? I suggest that we stand to gain two things. Number one is fairness. None of us wants to be the person who's unfairly limiting opportunity from somebody who is capable of doing amazing things, but they don't look the part. So we can hire better people, we can promote better talent, right? The second thing that we stand to gain is actually better companies that are going to create better products 
and be more successful. And in order for that to happen, two things need to occur. Number one is we have to be looking for talent in unconventional places because it's there. It's just waiting for us, but we're not tapping into it. But the second is we, once they're in our company, you have to create the environment where diverse perspectives can actually be heard, recognized, and acted upon. And I'm going to give you a brief example of how on my own team I think about this. Um, I'm going to introduce you to three people who worked on the unconscious bias efforts with me. This is Jeff, Bailey, and Judith. Now, they look to be a pretty diverse crew in terms of race, age, uh, academic background, nationality. Um, and each of them was presented with this unconscious bias problem. And their ideas can be represented through these shapes, generally speaking. And uh, when you put them all together, you can see that there is a lot of overlap in the ideas that they had and that I had about how we could tackle this at Google. But there's also a lot of uniqueness. But an odd thing happens when people get together in a group. When you join a group, you're very often not inclined to share unique information. Instead, what you do is you share information you think other people in the group have. And you do that because you want to be liked, you want to be respected, and you want to be heard. And the best way for that to happen is to contribute at ideas that other people are going to agree with and say, yeah, that's a great idea. I should have thought of that. That sounds really good. But they probably had thought of that. Um, that's a very safe thing for us to do. But what we want to do is create environments where all the other ideas that are unique to the individual can be safely expressed and recognized and acted upon. So that is what we're trying to achieve. Now, how are we going to achieve that at Google or in any other organizations? In any other organization? We think that we have to answer three very difficult questions. And I'm going to take you through each of them that we've been asking. You could probably add a fourth, a fifth, a sixth to this, but we'll start here. Uh, the questions are this, these. Number one, how can we raise the collective awareness about how our, how our minds work and how bias functions within organizations so that this effort that we're embarking on doesn't end, end up being an HR effort or the, the pet project of a couple of executives who care about it passionately, where everybody says, I understand it's a problem, and I want to help fix it. And then the second is, once that awareness is achieved, how do we actually translate that into behavior that leads to better decision making? And then the third, and this is the one that's really vexing me right now, how do we get past this as a special effort? And how do we change a culture so that long after we're done talking about dedicated initiatives, the culture is supporting unbiased behaviors and a better view of what people are capable of, so cultural change. So I'm going to go through each of these. And I'm going to start with the education piece. How do we raise collective awareness? Now, this is where we started. And we've been at this for a very long time. And we developed a workshop and all sorts of activities. And I've come to realize that education is sort of like coping with loss. So if you know of the psychologist uh, Kubler-Ross, she was examining people who lost loved ones. And she basically says, if you've lost something precious to you, you go through several stages of grieving. First of all, it's going to be denial. Then it's going to be anger. Then it's going to be depression. And then it's going to be acceptance. We go through something similar when we're trying to educate people about unconscious bias. So I'm going to take you through my version of the Kubler-Ross. And it starts with this point of resistance, which is uh, there's no bias here. We're an amazing company and a meritocratic industry. So even if bias exists somewhere out in the world, it's not here. We have this myth of the technology industry that it is the most meritocratic and bias is unlikely to exist here. But you only need to look at the numbers to realize something's going on here. And fortunately, there's a lot of research that points to what that something is. So there are uh, classic resume studies. So there was a study done in 2005 where uh, a researcher created resumes, sent it out to actual job postings. And then on the resume, uh, he put African-American sounding names or white sounding names. But the content was exactly identical. A resume with an African-American sounding name, you have to send 50% more of them out to get one callback than if it has a white sounding name, even though the content is identical. So that is evidence of bias. There is research that's much closer to home for us, and that took place in uh, the uh, uh, investor area. So what the, uh, these researchers did a couple of years ago is they actually looked at people who were pitching to investors an idea and looking for funding. And then they looked at the gender of the person who was delivering the pitch. It turns out that if a male was delivering the pitch, they were 60% more likely to actually receive funding than if a female were delivering that pitch. And it's not just being male. All the better if you are an attractive male. They were significantly more likely to receive it. Now, what happened here? Was this overt sexism? 
No, it wasn't. Think about the situation you are in if you are an investor. I don't know a ton of information about the person who's pitching the idea. It's likely a new idea whose future I don't quite know. There's a lot of ambiguity, um, and there's a lot of my money that's on the line here, so there's huge risk for me. I'm going to give my money to the person who makes me feel the most confident that there is a successful future for what I'm trying to pitch, and we have a prototype for what a successful business person looks like, and it's a very good looking male, because they're associated with uh, presumed leadership ability, charisma, problem solving ability, techno technological capability, right? And so that is what's under here, not conscious, completely unconscious. Now, a lot of people criticized this study and they said, well, it's possible that the women were just delivering lower quality pitches. So what they did next was they actually wrote a script for a pitch, trained men and women to deliver it in exactly the same manner, sent them out, and then asked people, which of these two people would you back? And it turns out, 68% of the time, the people reviewing the pitches uh, wanted to give their money to the man. Even though the content was the same, the delivery was the same. So this is the kind of bias that we're talking about, and it's hard to argue against it when the research is done so systematically. Okay, so let's say everybody in the room now agrees that bias is an issue, and it exists in our industry. The next point of resistance along our journey is this. Okay, it exists, but I'm not part of the problem. My mom worked and my be best friend is black, so we should talk to the other people, right? Now, all of us want to believe and do believe that we are good people, uh, we do not want to restrict opportunity to people who deserve to have it. We cannot, in the last 10 years, think about any decision that we've made that we think is biased, so how can we be part of the problem? The conundrum is it's unconscious. We have all absorbed, through our culture, notions of success, capability, expectations, um, and it takes a little bit of cleverness to actually reveal that. So I'm going to show you a way that psychologists have actually started to um, reveal people's biases in a way that they can really grab onto it. Now, this is gonna require a little bit of interaction with you, but don't worry, I'm not gonna make anybody say anything. It's only gonna involve raising hands. You with me? We can do this, okay. So, this is called the Implicit Association Test. It was developed by researchers at Harvard, uh, Mazarin Banaji, and at the University of Washington, Tony Greenwald. And um, I'll show you how it goes. Now, in this test, it's very simple, Two categories appear on the screen. You see male and female. Now what's gonna happen is words are gonna flash in the middle of the screen. And if it's a word associated with being male, I want you to raise your left hand. If it's a word associated with female or being female, I want you to raise your right hand. Got it? Now I'm gonna move re really fast because this is intended to be a time test. Here we go. Now I'm gonna switch the categories. So on the screen you're gonna see types of college majors. Liberal arts, left hand. Science, right hand. Here we go. All right, very good. I have to tell you that I had to take psychology out of this list because our Google engineers insisted that it was liberal arts. It is not, it is science. So um, that is why you did not see that on the list. Okay, now we are going to make things a little bit trickier. We're actually gonna combine categories. So left hand if it's female or liberal arts, right hand if it's male or science. Here we go. All right, good. I noticed a little bit slower, but it should be because it's a little bit more complicated. We have one more round to go, and as you might have guessed, we're gonna switch the categories. So this time, left if it's male or liberal arts, right if it's female or science, and off we go. Oh, okay. Now, just one more hand raise. Raise your hand if that last set was a little bit more difficult than the ones before. Right, I'm gonna guess around 75% of you are raising your hand right now because that is the population average of people who have a slower response time to that last set than they do for the others and it doesn't matter where the placement is. A lot of engineers say it, it's because it's the last thing you showed us. It doesn't matter if it was the first thing I showed you, it would be more difficult. Why is it difficult? Because we just have associated in our brain the concept of men and science. It doesn't mean that we don't believe women can be good scientists, they can be, but it's a little bit more difficult a concept for us. The other thing that's really interesting about this research 
men and women have the same probability of associating men with science, and it doesn't actually even matter if you are a woman scientist. Um, so these are, this is not intended to be um, an, a remonstration of men and the things that they believe. It's all of us, right? So that's, that's the tricky nature of unconscious bias. So um, one thing that you hopefully took away from this is, yes, you probably are biased in some way, but don't worry, so am I. And this was actually painfully made aware to me a few weeks ago. I was giving a talk on unconscious bias in our Dublin office, and on the way to the, the conference venue, I was trying to come up with an example of me being biased because I thought if I could personalize it, people would say, oh, well, he's biased too, and we feel better. I could not think of one way that I was biased, and I'm like, oh my god, it really sucks to be this enlightened. So then I <laughs> got into a cab, and I was going to the venue, and then I was like, holy crap. Just five minutes ago, as I was having that self-congratulatory conversation with myself, I was trying to check myself out of the hotel as quickly as possible because I was running late. And what I did was I scanned all the people who were behind the registration desk, and I picked the person that I thought was going to check me out the fastest. And I'm not, I won't embarrass myself by telling you who I picked, but I will tell you that I looked at gender, I looked at ethnicity, I looked at age, and I looked at like general tidiness, and I made my decision. And so I was like, wow, I guess I don't have to look that far. What I would like to do is be able to stop myself before I made that decision, but I didn't. I caught myself afterwards. Um, now, the question that you might have in your mind is, does it matter? And I'm going to say that, yes, it actually does matter that I made that decision as small as it might seem. That brings us to the next point of resistance, which is the effects seem small, especially when you, do the, when you look at the literature. So again, are we making a huge deal out of something that's really tiny and likely to be inconsequential? Now, to show what the power of bias is like, a psychologist in 1996 actually did something I, I think is quite clever. He created a fictional organization and ran a computer simulation where he was able to program in bias to see what would happen across people who are all biased in the same direction and over time. And it showed that even a tiny bias can have big consequences. Um, so this is the, what the simulated organization looked like. There were eight levels in the organization. And what you can imagine is that uh, at every single level, 50% men, 50% women, there were around 500 people at level one, about 10 people at level two. And uh, this is the way it looked. Now, what happens in this organization is that every year, 15% of, of people leave at every single level. And the way that we replace the person who left is by grabbing somebody from the level below. And the person we grab from the level below is picked exclusively based on their performance score. Now, the performance score was biased against women by just 1%. And you can imagine that as every man in this fictional organization received a performance score between 1 and 101. Every woman received a performance score between 1 and 100. That's how small the bias was. Now if you hit play, you can see the, what happens with that 1% bias over time. And you can stop it now. And so what you can see is that even though it's only 1%, uh, the, we're losing women at every single level as we go up. Um, and it's like kind of petering out at 39% at the top. And women are pooling uh, at the bottom. And so this is actually an understatement of the kind of bias that people are likely to be experiencing in the industry. So to me, a beautiful illustration that even small evidence of bias can have an effect if we're all biased in the same direction towards the same people. All right, so then finally, here we are. I've proven that bias actually exists, that we all could potentially be part of the problem, that even small evidence of bias can have a cumulative effect. And now I'm just depressed because you started this presentation by telling me it was unconscious. And unconscious, by its definition, means that I don't have much control over it, right? And this is a very depressing place to end. And you can imagine that the first people who went through our unconscious bias workshop were not very pleased towards the end of it. And we were like, oh, crap, we should probably come up with some proposed solutions. So that is what we spent a lot of time actually working on. And I uh, have to give credit to social psychologists for showing us that bias exists and telling us the conditions under which they exist. But where they've left us hanging is they have presented us with very few viable ways of combating bias. So what we've done is taken the evidence that we can out of the literature and tried to design programs and recommendations around it. All of these things are still in progress at Google. But I, I feel confident enough in these recommendations that I want to throw them out to you. And if at least one thing sticks with you, I would recommend that you give it a try. And I think it'll, I think it'll have positive effects. So let's go through. 
um, them. It leads us, of course, to the question two that I had posed from the very beginning. What are the decisions that we're making every day and how can we unbias them? Okay, there are four things that I want to suggest to you. The first, in my mind, is the most important, which is we have to structure for success. There are formal decisions that we're making all the time that affect people. And I'm talking here about hiring decisions, the decision of who to put on an important project, performance scores if we give them to people in our organization, the decision to promote people, deciding whom to fire if that's required, formal people processes, but very often, if you ask people what they're looking for in a candidate, if you ask them how they select, it's pretty vague, right? It's a, you know, a belief about the kind of person that's gonna add value to the organization. What are you looking for in the job? Well, we want somebody who's gonna create something new. Such poor specificity that gives us license to select people who feel good to us, but that we don't have a lot of hard evidence for. And so this can actually cause problems, and I'm gonna give you an example of why. This is uh, referring to a research project that was done a few years ago. And what happened in this research project was that people who came into it had to select somebody to be a police chief. And the researchers had created several different kinds of resumes and gave them out to people. They didn't put any names on it. And uh, some of them had a lot of education and some of them had a lot of experience. It turns out, surprisingly, that people preferred a highly educated person to be a police chief. It, that emerged as the number one criterion amongst this population set. Very interesting. Study two, they took the same resumes and then they put names on the resumes and they randomly assigned a woman's name to it or a man's name to it, repeat the exercise. And what they found was that people wanted a man in the role and not a woman. And so afterwards they were asked, well, why did you want this man in the role? And sometimes they said, we want this man in the role because he's highly educated and we think education is important. Or they said, this guy had a lot of street, uh, street experience and we think that's really important for the role and that's why we wanted him in there. They had no idea that their perceptions of what it takes to succeed in the role actually were driven by the gender of the candidate they were reviewing. No idea. So study three is the interesting one. What they did is before you saw any resume at all, you were given a list of things that you could consider when reviewing resumes and you were asked, which of these characteristics do you think is most important for the role of police chief? And people said, education's number one, experience is number two. The resumes were distributed with names attached and a surprise finding, no more gender bias. Regardless of whether it was a male or a female candidate, people picked the person with, that, with the education. Now what happened in that third condition? What happened was people made a declaration about what was important and it cued them in to find that information and pick the best candidate. So we took that to heart at Google and one thing that we are very adamant about doing right now, number one, describing every role that we're hiring for and figuring out what success looks like before we see a single candidate. And I know it can be hard, especially if we have young organizations and some of these roles are a little bit fuzzy, put, but put a stake in the ground on what you're looking for. Number two, design your interviews questions, if you use interviews, explicitly to test against the things that you think are important for the role you're hiring for. And then use the exact same question for every single candidate and take notes and then apply a, rating, a, a grading rubric for the answers. It almost sounds like a robotic interview experience, and it sort of is, but it leads to beautiful outcomes. You will be surprised at how many times you are not hiring the person that you felt the greatest connection to during the interview, and how often you're just going to, with the person who had the best fit with the job required. And research shows that this far and away will give you higher quality candidates, male and female, black and white, than an unstructured interview approach. Okay, second thing, collect data. Uh, almost anything can be quantified, um, and I think probably we're all very good at quantifying things like how many users are using our mobile uh, device, where are they clicking when they visit our website, all that sort of stuff. But we need to be equally sophisticated in collecting data about our candidates, about our employees, when did they start, when did they get promoted, what was their last performance score, how much did they get paid, when was their last raise. When you get enough employees in your organization, pick a point in time, and actually segment all of that data by the characteristics of people that might disadvantage them in some way. So male versus female, black versus white, and do that analysis repeatedly. Only by doing the analysis across people will you find problem areas in your company. So that is something that we do constantly. The other thing is get feedback from the people who are using your products um, and find out if, you are, if your products are having, providing the same experience across demographics. 
We've learned this the hard way at Google through several examples. Here's one that uh, happened relatively recently, and it had to do with actually making um, video uploads uh, easy to do to YouTube. So what happened was uh, we created this feature where you could shoot a video from your phone and then hit a button and it automatically uploads to YouTube. It looked great. We got a lot of great user feedback. Um, but then what we found was 10% of our videos were uploaded upside down. We were like, wow, that's a little bit weird. Is it a bug in the system? Like, what's going on? Uh, well, we had some friendly input from left-handed users that said, uh, guys, when I take a video, I go like this. And to you as a right-handed uh, developer, that seems like it's upside down, but to me, that's the normal way that I use my phone. So um, obviously, we just had to do a quick fix. But and this is sort of a silly example, but it is an example of creating a product based on your experience. So we had a whole bunch of right-handed engineers uh, designing this feature without even awareness that people can have a different way of taking video depending on which hand they use. OK. Third recommendation is to evaluate the subtle cues that you are sending. I'm guessing that most of us work in like quirky work environments. It's not a conventional organization. We've got uh, clever conference room names. We've got posters up on the wall. We've got things that we repeat as stories within our organization. Um, these are fun. They're lively. They make our organization spontaneous and, and great. However, they are also sending messages all the time about who's valued, um, who belongs, and whether people feel welcomed. And so there was this uh, research that was really inspiring to me that was actually done out of Stanford. It was so simple. These researchers brought uh, undergraduates into the computer science building and had them complete an interest inventory. Lots of computer, uh, or lots of uh, um, majors that you could choose from, and they simply asked, how interested are you in these majors? History, music, science, computer science, et cetera. That's it. The only permutation was, Half of the students came into a room that had sort of a high-tech feel to it. It had computer parts, actual computers, sci-fi posters on the wall. The other half of the students came into a more industry-neutral industry room in the computer science building. What, what ended up happening is that women students who came into this room were significantly less likely to say they had any interest in pursuing computer science as a major than men who came into this room and compared to women who went into this room over here. Those women who came into the more neutral room were equally as likely as men to say computer science was a field that they would like to pursue. No other difference. So that is how powerful subtle cues can be in telling a person whether they are welcome, if that is the kind of environment that they want to work in. So we, after reading this literature, we kind of went back into our um, buildings. We looked around with fresh eyes, and we saw lots of examples of messages that we were inadvertently sending to our employees. The one that um, stuck out to me most was, the building I was working in, um, in Mountain View at the time, had conference rooms that were named after famous scientists. Not one of those scientists was a woman. And we're just like, uh, that wasn't intentional, but it is definitely sending a cue. So we went through and systematically renamed a whole portion of them. Um, seems small to us. Most people didn't notice. But I guarantee you there were a lot of uh, women employees at Google who did notice and, were, and appreciated it. OK, final thing that I recommend is that accountability is so key. And the first person to hold accountable for making unbiased decision is hold yourself accountable. If you are in a rush, if you are emotional, if you don't have a lot of information but you're making an important decision, take a moment and stop and ask yourself, should I trust my instincts here? And then justify the decision that you're making to somebody else. Super simple, but research shows if you simply justify your decision, you're, you're significantly less likely to make a bad decision. Then you have to hold other people accountable. And you have to be open to being held accountable yourself. You would be amazed at how many times I have been called uh, sexist or racist while giving an unconscious bias presentation. And I think that's actually a great outcome, right? Um, and, and we can engage in that. Uh, one way that we are helping people hold each other accountable is that we identify the biases most likely to be expressed and then we give people a checklist. So the way that we give performance scores at Google is a group of managers sits around a table, and they discuss the performance of their, their direct reports, and then they assign a score. The performance period is six months. Unstructured, these conversations are rife with bias. Um, there's anchoring bias, halo and horns effects, recency bias. We actually categorize the ones that were most likely to be uttered. 
We put them on a checklist to find them and then told people what they could do when they heard it. And when you walk into the room as a manager, we hand out this sheet and we say, your responsibility is not only to represent your direct report, but you also have to call your colleagues out on any of these biases that you witness, right? And checklists like this can be used in hiring, they can be used in uh, performance discussions, all sorts of places. Okay, so finally, and most importantly, me, importantly to me right now is, how do we take everything we just talked about and change a culture of an organization that has been developing over the last 15 plus years? Uh, one of the best ways that I've found for this is making it okay to talk about bias. And we're actually right now trying to count utterances of bias, stereotyping, diversity, all that sort of stuff, and all the channels Google employees are using to communicate with each other. Now, we have a culture at Google where, that is heavy in memeing. So meme is, of course, a picture with a sarcastic saying on it. If you have a thought that runs across your mind as a Google employee and you're feeling creative, you create a meme about it, you post it publicly on what we call meme gen. So everyone at Google can actually see it and chuckle along with you. We actually counted to see if people are using these terms more after our unconscious bias efforts than before. And um, as you might imagine, they had a lot of really interesting, funny little things to say about unconscious bias, mostly good, but none of them as good as this one. So when this meme appeared, I was like, oh, oh I'm doing such a good job. But to be honest, this isn't represented, re representative. This is probably more representative <laughs> of what people were thinking. So if you are awake, if you are awake at this point, you're probably doing better than a lot of Google employees who sat through the very similar training as what you are doing. Um, but the good news is that the utterances are uh, plateauing at a level that was higher than we started. And we've also, I can tell you, whenever we launch a new program in HR, somebody is emailing us saying, have you thought about X or Y or Z related to unconscious bias? They're actually calling our executives out when they're on stage about things that they have said that they don't think are really cool after taking this course. That's how I think we're gonna shift the culture. So if I were to summarize quickly everything that we reviewed today, um, I would say uh, keep in mind that while we're talking about representation, uh, it's about more than that. It's about creating a diverse workforce and a diverse team, but it's also ensuring that once people get into your organization, that they have that safe space to express their uniqueness. Otherwise, you could have the most diverse group in the world around the table, and you will all only hash out the, same, the things that you all believe everybody else knows. Second is education is key. You do not want to embark on this effort only on your own, so you need to empower people with a the language. Then you have to tell them how, once you know these concepts, how they're gonna change their behavior. The four things that I told you before is where we're starting. And then finally, this is what we're trying to get to a systematic change in the, in the culture that we have at Google. And my hope for the world is that if every organization takes this topic seriously, every organization tries to make substantial changes, even employees that leave Google are gonna land in another company where they feel equally valued, equally responsible for the well-being of their colleagues. And, and along the way, I think the tech industry as a whole is gonna become a lot more diverse than what we see today. So we often use this phrase at Google to talk about the future of our products. Uh, or what, it, what the future holds for us as a company, be uncomfortably excited, but I can think of no better way to uh, describe how I feel about the unconscious bias effort. Uncomfortably excited about what it'll bring. There are so many ways that I would like to answer your question. Number one is, um, we always talk about diversity as being a good thing. It has all these great positive outcomes. It also has negative outcomes that people don't talk about as much, which is uh, you bring a lot of people together who are different and they're expressing their differences. It leads to misunderstanding. It, me it can lead to conflicts. In the short run, people actually are less comfortable working in a diverse group than they are working with people who are a lot like themselves. That's why in early stage uh, organization development, it's often the people that you know the best that you're, that you're with and you feel great. Um, research that has been done longer term actually shows that you can get over this awkward phase because you get used to the working patterns of other people. So I would say for anybody who has been in a diverse group and you didn't like it, uh, you probably didn't stick it with it long enough. And then the other thing is like, okay, so you say diversity is good, but we're also saying remove any, any evidence of gender, race, or whatever when you make decisions. Um, uh, I actually think the, uh, the blind uh, 
when we talk about like gender and race blind hiring practices, for example, what that is going to do is eliminate those cues when you're making decisions. And so any restriction and diversity that you have in your workforce due to actual bias in the selection will be corrected for and you will end up with some diversity there. Um, and then you have to ask the question like, should we proactively go out and seek diversity in order for us to have that? And I think you can do both. Um, what we do at Google is we're very uh, aggressive in our uh, candidate outreach and recruitment practices to make sure that we're tapping into places that have diverse talent so we can bring them in. But when we look at the actual processes used to screen them as candidates, we try to remove as much information that's going to distract people as possible. The last thing you want to do is select somebody because they're a member of a group. Not only is that unfair to them, it's unfair to all the people who have been selected on you know, actual qualifications. So it's, it's a tight rope. Uh, that is such a tough one. So when you don't have a large enough pool to choose from, I mean, obviously you have to make decisions in the short run. There are a couple of things. One is um, make sure that there isn't actually a larger pool than you think there is. One of the traps that we had fallen into early on in our recruiting practices, we were so used to recruiting from the same sources that we were sort of blind to other sources of talent. And then once we opened our eyes and said, wow, there are a lot of other places around the world graduating great computer science students, it was a lot more diverse than we thought. So that's number one. Um, number two is when you get to a point where you can actually invest in diversifying whatever pool you're recruiting from, uh, definitely do that. So we have a lot of investment in K through 12 programs, getting a, a, a atypical students interested in computer science, and the yields on that will not be felt for years to come. Um, and then the third is, uh, for some roles, we think we need a mechanical engineer, but sometimes we can go to an aligned field that's uh, maybe a little bit more diverse that gives the same core skill set and they can be trained up on the other things. And so that's the other thing that we can do is uh, question your notion about who you need for the role that you're recruiting for and see if you can't recruit past that group. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can. So with that, thank you. Thank you.